Possiamo iniziare, bentrovati, buongiorno, buon pomeriggio. Eh, la sessione mh, di oggi, eh, nella sessione pomeridiana, ha mh, un ospite che viene dagli Stati Uniti, dall'Università della Central Florida in Orlando, e eh, il professor Richard Archon, eh, che eh, farà una mh, presentazione su i cinque elementi chiave dal suo punto di vista che devono riguardare la, la ricerca sull'e-learning. Le osservazioni che saranno messe in campo derivano dalla constatazione che si produce molto e-learning, le esperienze di learning stanno aumentando, cioè facciamo e-learning nella scuola, nell'università, nei contesti aziendali, nei contesti professionali, per la formazione continua, ma eh, secondo il punto di vista del collega non c'è abbastanza ricerca che sostenga questo tipo di innovazione delle metodologie di insegnamento e apprendimento. E eh, la sua argomentazione verterà su questo appunto, identificare quali siano le piste di ricerca sulle quali eh, investire di più mh, in questo momento, in questo preciso momento storico. Uh, una pista secondo il collega sono sicuramente i learning analytics, quindi uh, i dati, uh, strumenti di data analysis e di visualizzazione che possono aiutare uh, chi deve prendere decisioni nell'e-learning, nella progettazione, nella valutazione delle azioni di learning e anche nella erogazione di un buon e-learning a seconda dei livelli. Uh, la contestualizzazione degli interventi di learning, quindi la valutazione dell'efficacia del, eh, dei progetti, dei programmi di learning a secondo del contesto formale, informale, scuola, ambienti di lavoro eccetera nel quale si deve sviluppare e eh, un'altra enfasi, eh, un'altra attenzione importante secondo il collega sarà quella di eh, sviluppare ricerche sul, eh, sulle nuove tecnologie, quindi sull'intelligenza eh, artificiale, la realtà virtuale, in che modo queste nuove tecnologie che stanno emergendo anche a livello consumer diciamo in tutte le case eh, di tutti noi eh, possono avere un impatto nel uh, ripensare le pratiche di learning che svolgiamo e quindi è sostanzialmente un appello quello che viene, eh, verrà rivolto dal collega a tutti noi la comunità scientifica a eh, unire gli sforzi su eh, appunto questi 4-5 temi chiave che possono alimentare la, la ricerca nei prossimi anni. Il collega appunto è eh, professore presso l'Università della Central California, eh, scusate, Florida, e eh, coordina un dottorato di ricerca sulle tecnologie dell'istruzione e sull'e-learning e si occupa specificamente di eh, analisi dell'efficacia degli interventi di learning e di sperimentazione di ambienti innovativi per l'apprendimento. Quindi eh, lascio direttamente la parola al collega, l'intervento si svolgerà in inglese avremo poi qualche minuto successivamente per eh, un confronto, un dibattito che si svolgerà anche questo eh, in inglese e quindi buon ascolto. So, please welcome uh, our guest here, Richard Archer. Thank you very much, Pierre Paul. I, I did offer to do this in Italian, but uh, it would be about a six-hour presentation because each word would be spoken very slowly, and, and y'all would probably have much more difficulty understanding it that way. Um, so he, he told me I could do it in English, so thank you. Um, so when Pierre Paul asked me to present today uh, in a session on the quality of online learning, uh, back when he originally asked me, I kind of thought about what I was going to talk about. and really originally thought, started with some practice kind of ideas, but there's a lot of practice going on and a lot of that practice really isn't making its way into the hands of the people that make a lot of decisions related to e-learning. It's not getting published uh, at the rate that the practice, the innovative practice is actually happening. So what I thought I would do is sort of do a top 10 list of gaps in e-learning research. When I started investigating that a little bit more, I started seeing there, there are 10, but there's really five that are really key issues right now, in my opinion. And then there's these other five or six that there still needs a lot of work 
there's still a lot of work to be done in those areas, but they, there's quite a lot going on research-wise and practice-wise in those areas. So I sort of, this is the five gaps in e-learning, but it's also kind of 11 gaps in e-learning, but two, uh, uh, five, six of them are kind of already um, key issues. I'm pretty flexible with this, so um, time-wise I can speed up, slow down, so if we're having a good time and this is useful to y'all, then we'll keep going. Um, if I'm boring the heck out of you, somebody just throw something at me and I'll speed it up and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so, all right. So just real quickly about my world. Um, as Pierre Paolo mentioned, I am at the University of Central Florida, which is located in very hot Orlando, Florida, or very rainy Orlando, Florida. It's either hot or rainy in Orlando, Florida. There's no in between anything there. Um, Probably most known for Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and while I enjoy the Disney uh, adventure every now and then, and it, Disney actually does a ton related to e-learning, um, there's a lot more that really pulled me to Orlando to work, to work in this environment. Um, the first one is where the UCF, University of Central Florida, not just because they employ me but they are a uh, metropolitan suburban university of over 66,000 students. Uh, pro we used to say, we, we were allowed to say that we were the second largest university in the United States. Um, our administration yells at us now because we, we're, we're first and then we're third and then we're second. And so and we're not allowed to say we're second, but we're one of the top three largest universities in the country. Um, we are classified as a very high research activity university. Uh, we have over 220 degree programs across 11 colleges and um, 11 campuses across the C Central Florida area. Um, I'm not bragging about UCF, but what I'm kind of trying to address in that is there's a great deal of diversity, a great deal of opportunity, um, a great deal of uh, collaboration that's going on in that university because of that population. But that size, a lot of times in, in higher ed, size means slow, uh, but here, it's, it's, that's really not the case with uh, UCF. UCF's tagline is UCF stands for opportunity, and that's a very, very true phrase. If you're at the University of Central Florida and you can't find something to do, that's a U issue, not a UCF issue. Very robust uh, research. Um, environment, uh, practice environment related to e-learning there. Also is the Florida Virtual School. Um, most of y'all probably haven't heard of the Florida Virtual School, but uh, it's kind of mirrors the University of Central Florida in that it, uh, but at a K-12 virtual school kind of level. It's one of, if not the largest virtual schools in the country. It's in, uh, it work in it's in all 50 states. I believe it's in 68 countries that they teach courses. Uh, there's a very active research um, agenda going on at Florida Virtual School and a lot of innovative practice going on there as well. So it's a very dynamic uh, K-12 learning environment. So we have the higher ed kind of covered. We have the K-12 kind of covered. And then right next to the University of Central Florida is Research Park, and I know these logos mean absolutely nothing to you, but there are military institutions here, here. Um, these two work a lot with military Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics. There are K-12 school districts. Seminole County is a kind of high-end, not a super diverse uh, K-12 uh, uh, public school district. Orange County Public Schools is the 10th largest public school district in the country. So we have the, one of the largest virtual schools. We have the 10th largest public school district. Um, we have the National Center for Simulation. I saw somebody present earlier. I didn't expect to come here and see a picture of the Link Simulator, so that was kind of cool. Um, so they do, a, that's a not-for-profit that does a lot of work with K-12 uh, organizations. We ha anyone have, anyone play video games? Have children that play video games? Yeah. The only video game I um, own is FIFA, and it's made by EA Sports. That's housed in Orlando. They do a ton with e-learning as well. So it's a very robust, non-traditional educational setting environment in that, in that regard. So this is my world. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit skewed. 
Um, so in kind of, prepare, I, I have such a, a lot going on around me that's very innovative in regards to practice and research. So in doing this, I kind of had to step back because uh, I, I kind of know I have that sort of skewed world um, and started to look at the bigger picture of things. So I did sort of a deep dive into what's been published recently, what's going on, um, what, it, what are the trends and statistics, and I hate numbers and statistics in that regard, but they're really useful here to kind of highlight some of the things that are going on in the e-learning environment. So um, fortunately, the Babson group did a lot of the legwork for me, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about statistics, um, but I'll just touch on a few kind of key things. Uh, here, the, the numbers are still going up. This, these are United States numbers, but we're seeing these trends in Europe and in a lot of other countries uh, or a lot of other continents, a lot of areas, depending on where they are in the e-learning uh, landscape. So do they have access, those kind of things. Um, so we're seeing a continual upward shift in the number of students taking e-learning courses. Nothing really groundbreaking here. Uh, everyone in here pretty much probably sees that similar thing, right? Yes? No, maybe? Someone want to throw something at me? No? Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting here is that while uh, obviously face-to-face -face and blended courses are the most prevalent modes of instruction, e-learning or online-only courses are starting to creep up on them. And what we're seeing is over 2.8 million students, uh, these are higher ed, taking exclusively online courses, up about 4% from the previous year, which was also up about 3% from the previous year there. Um, I think this is really driven by three factors. Uh, the first one is increase in quality in online learning. Um, the initial drivers of online courses in higher education were private, in, um, for-profit institutions. And the quality wasn't really great. Also, when public institutions kind of took it on, the faculty members that were teaching it didn't really know how to teach an online course. They didn't know what a good online course looked like. Um, the, so the quality issue has significantly increased. There are a lot of, of, uh, of, there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of preparation for faculty members and teachers that are implementing online courses. There's a lot of kind of support for teaching uh, online. So the quality consequently has gone up. A lot of research that's been done related to it that has kind of impacted that quality. A second thing is kind of the minimum reduction in the stigma associated with online learning. When online learning initially came out, there was sort of, if you had an online degree, it was viewed negatively compared to a traditional degree. And because of that increase in quality, the fact that it's no longer just for-profit institutions doing uh, online learning, that we're starting to see that stigma go away, um, at least in the States. And then the last thing is increase in technolo technological functionality. There's so much more you can do with in an online course than in the past. Um, I, when I first taught my, when I taught my first online course 15 years ago, it was 100% web-based. I taught, I created it with web, Adobe Go Live, which doesn't even exist anymore. I used third-party discussion forums. Students submitted their work to me via email. They asked me questions via email. Web, web conferencing didn't really exist in any way that was useful. Um, so that's, that, that's changed a lot. Now students can interact via video conferencing within their own groups within a classroom. So there's not that kind of disconnect anymore. So there's tons of those three kind of drivers, there's others, but those three drivers have kind of shifted the increase in online only courses and the people taking them are not people that would traditionally take online only courses. Um, just to kind of exemplify this on in my world, uh, UCF last year in the last ac academic year, 42.5% of our student credit hours were either online or blended courses. So almost, not quite half, but almost half of our total student course hours were either online or blended with 32.5%, so almost a third of online only courses. So that's pretty significant. Um, it also has a pretty significant impact on the ecosystem of your university. 81% um, of students, so four out of every five students, took either an online or a blended course. Um, there's a lot of implications for addressing that. 
83.5% uh, of undergraduates and 63% of graduate students took online course, uh, took um, online or blended courses. And then 72% of students took online only courses with about three out of every four undergraduates and a little over half of every graduate student taking online only courses. So these are significant numbers and the way that you deal with an institution or approach an institution, um, the culture, the infrastructure, et cetera, is very different for this population than for another uh, online face-to-face -face only population, which we know doesn't exist anymore, but the continual increase in numbers has some significant uh, implications. Um, this one was really interesting to me. Two-thirds of academic leaders call online education critical to the long-term strategy of my institution. Two-thirds, that's a pretty good number, but it's actually down about 15% from the previous two years. And so when I was having some conversations with people regarding this, and I thought, uh, well, one of the things that came up is, are we now in sort of a downward trend of the view, are we kind of reverting back to a negative view of online or blended learning? And my thought on this was that, no, I think what we're really starting to see is that online learning and hybrid learning is not really viewed as something different. It's so ingrained in the educational landscape now that it's just part of it. It's not something that's standalone or separate. So I think that the educational leaders here that were polled kind of don't even think about it as something separate. It's just something that they do, um, which is important. It makes, makes it even more important for what we're doing. Um, over half, uh, or actually interesting also, 17% uh, of academic leaders said that the online outcomes were superior or somewhat superior to face-to-face, -face, which 10 years ago, that was about 0%. Um, how many of y'all could have walked up to your dean or, or somebody and asked them, is, is this online course better than your face-to-face -face course? Or a faculty member even and ask them. Probably not a whole lot, right? Um, and then over half say that it's, that it's either, uh, the, that the outcomes are the same, online and face-to-face. -face. Um, I'm going to fly through. Um, with, related to blended learning, we're still seeing that blended learning is uh, more popular and viewed by leaders and faculty as being superior. And I think this is a little bit of self-preservation. Like, I'm a face-to-face I'm a -face teacher. I need to be in front of my students. They need to see me. They need to hear me to actually get a quality instructional experience, right? Does anyone here think that? I kind of do. So, um, I, yeah, I dazzle my students with brilliance. So that's that's my goal. Um, so yeah, but but we're seeing the gap kind of decrease quite a bit. Um, and then as far as the students and and teachers go, we're starting to see that they still think that blended and hybrid can um, outperform face-to-face. -face. We are seeing an increase in the number of people that feel that blended or hybrid is inferior, but the gap between those two is a little bit, is, is decreasing, so. Okay. So why does this all matter? Well, um, it seems as though e-learning is becoming much more ubiquitous, much more accepted. Um, so those stats kind of highlight that, but I wanted to share some quotes that I've had either said directly to me or applied or implied through uh, policy or um, said, shared with me through other people. I'll fly through these because these, this kind of illustrate that there are these significant uh, misconceptions that are still out there by the bulk of people that, that aren't in our world. Um, and so we as researchers really need to do a better job of kind of getting the word out about the, these, addressing these misconceptions. Um, one of the things that we see in our, in our colleges of education a lot of time in, in the states is that during really bad economic times, our enrollments shoot up. Do y'all have that experience? No? Okay. Well, and in good, so we don't get, when, the, when, the, when we have a poor economy, students come and take education courses. The, con the budget of the university is so bad that we don't really see any bump in, in money from that that when during really good economic con times, the enrollments of, on, of educate, colleges of education tend to decrease. So we're viewed negatively, like we have a great economy, why aren't your enrollments up? So we're kind of punished for it either way. And the result of this, at both institutions I've been at 
in higher ed for 15 years. I think 12 of those 15 years, the college I've been in has had some kind of budget issue. Um, so uh, a lot of times, leaders are looking for ways to address those issues. And one recently, through a policy implication or implementation, was that all online courses now have unlimited enrollment. Um, they could, so all of the courses could have as many students as wanted to take them. And that just is a fundamental misunderstanding of what an online course is. Can we teach online courses that have online, unlimited enrollment? Sure. I could teach a course with three, 400 students. It would be terrible. They would do a bunch of, I mean, there's only 24 hours in the day. They would take a bunch of multiple choice, self-graded tests. They maybe listen to me lecture. It wouldn't be a very high quality learning experience. Um, so this is a fundamental misunderstanding. Uh, actually, a, a, co a colleague of mine in engineering school wanted to teach a blended course. And he went, uh, so they meet eight times, half the times. He went to his department chair, and his department chair was like, that's great. That's an excellent idea. What are you going to teach the other eight times when you're not meeting with them? So the department chair thought, OK, well, you're only going to be doing half the work. So let's give you another course to teach. Again, a fundamental misunderstanding of what a, a hybrid course is. Um, you can't do internships online. Uh, this is kind of a, a quote from a, a faculty member who we were implementing a fully online teacher certification program, and we had to do student observations remotely in rural areas. And just they don't, a lot of times, teachers like to go, what I do in my classroom, there's no way I could do that online until you actually sit down with them and show them, oh, well, we could put a webcam in the classroom and we have somebody, or it could be controlled by you, and you could uh, then have a, po a debriefing afterwards via online or online. So th there's a lot of things, innovation, innovative practices that people who teach traditionally don't know about and don't really uh, think to uh, implement. Um, I really think the university is moving away from online course offerings. Um, this is one a couple years ago, and I think three years after this, this was a department chair. The university had like the highest enrollment in online learning um, that it ever ever had. Um, I can just take my face-to-face -face content and put it online. I don't see the big deal. Um, at our university, we have a pretty robust uh, faculty development. They, to, if, to teach online, you have to go through a full uh, semester-long process. So how, uh, we've had teachers teaching for 30 years. They have to go through that if they want to teach online. They tend to be a little bit resistant to that. I don't know why. They, they like their, they're kind of set in their ways. So they think that an online class is just taking their stuff, throwing it online. Uh, what's the big deal? It's, um, online courses are inferior to instructional quality, to face-to-face -face courses. Uh, this was a student of mine, and they had a, one of those courses where the teacher just took their face-to-face -face stuff, threw it online, and that, that was it. They had a bad experience. We know this is a problem because if a student has a negative experience in an online course, they're not going to take online courses or hybrid courses again. Um, I talked them into taking a course with somebody, some really get great instructor, um, take his online course. I think it was Dr. Hartshorn was his name. Um, and they immediately enrolled in the program after that course. So it's just their, their experiences. And I'll kind of skip over this one. Um, so really, another reason this is important is if we look at enrollments, face-to-face uh, -face enrollments have tend to be kind of be stagnant. So right here, for example, this is UCF. And f this is student credit hours. If we look at 0203 and 1617, the numbers for face to face are pretty much the same, right? But the only differences are really the primary differences are in video, which I don't even know what that is these days, blended learning, and then the, most of the growth has uh, obviously occurred in online learning. Well, what kind of implications does this kind of ha does this have for teaching, research, and, and service? Well, this environment versus this environment is very, very different. Um, not all of these 66,000 are online only. So the fact that these students exist right here and the infrastructure and ecosystem that's necessary to support them significantly enhances the experience of these 41,000 students. What kind of issues come into play here? There's a lot of faculty development issues. There's a lot of teacher or student preparation issues. So a lot of things come into play related to 
how the online element or the online community uh, in a higher ed institution or K-12 institution changes much more than just the instructional practices. And then um, it also, um, we're going to fly through this one here, it stimulates development, drives development. Uh, I mentioned earlier my first course was a website that I created and put online and dealt with via email and everything. I think this right here was one of my first uh, learning management systems, pretty, uh, pretty limited. This is a screen, you can probably barely see this, but a much more a screenshot here of my current uh, course where students can collaborate in their own groups via synchronously, asynchronously. They can create their own discussion groups. Um, there, there's a lot more contextual elements here, what's coming up, what to do. All of the content can be presented in a variety of ways. Um, just a ton, of, ton more functionality compared to the past. Uh, and then it also draw the communities that are associated with learning management systems. Obviously here, uh, Moodle, Moodle's, the Moodle community is great at developing add-ons and plugins for pretty much whatever you want to do in an online course. Uh, can, we use Canvas at the University of Central Florida. They're extremely responsive to anything we need. And to the community, there's thousands or hundreds of schools that use Canvas. Um, their response, they, they come out with plugins and updates and modifications and increased functionality all the time. Okay, so what is being done right now, and this is kind of the five, the six areas, the, the six through 11, I guess, of the top 11 uh, gaps. Well, there's a lot being done right now. Um, there are a number of journals within e-learning that have, were very e-learning foci that have increased in the past few years. Um, and what we're also seeing is that a lot more content-specific journals are publishing e-learning research. So your engineering education journals, they're publishing a lot of e-learning research. The last publication I actually had was in an engineering education journals. Business journals, those kind, a lot of non-traditional e-learning or non-traditional publication venues are publishing research related to uh, e-learning, e online and blended learning. Um, we're also seeing a lot more uh, international collaborations being published. So with technology, they're obviously uh, doing an international collaboration. It's much more easy than in the past. So we're, as I looked at the journals, what I started to see was a significant trend, upward trend in the number of international uh, collaborations that are being published um, all over. So what areas have really been um, focused on research-wise? And these are areas that, they're, like I said, they're probably 6 through 11 in the e-learning re e research gaps. Um, but there's been a lot of stuff done on these, but we have a long way to go. E-learning is a very uh, young field research-wise. So we have a lot more that can be done in these areas um, that are really, really important. The first one is access. There's been a lot of research on access, um, the digital divide, uh, how access to e-learning impacts rural communities, um, how uh, does it impact positively or negatively the digital divide, the gap between the haves and have-nots. Um, so there's a lot, a significant amount of research on that. There's obviously room for more because there's a, there's a great deal that hasn't been done related to rural communities that's really, really significant. Um, pedagogy, this is probably the one that's been, I don't want to say beaten to death, but most e-learning research is some kind of pedagogical intervention. Here's some instructional problem I have, here's my proposed pedagogical intervention, here's how I'm going to research it, here's what I found, here's a journal article. Okay. Um, what are the challenges associated with that? What are the opportunities? Uh, how does it impact various learners? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So pedagogy is a pretty common area, um, but there are so many pedagogical innovations that are happening daily that we have a lot of discussion of practice on, but not a lot of discussion on, of research on. Um, assessment, uh, we've kind of talked about that. There's a lot of stuff going on related to integrity issues um, earlier today the presentation on um, Tesla. So there's a lot of issues related to innovations in assessment, to uh, different methods of assessment, uh, how impactful different methods are, a lot going on with that 
formative versus in, uh, formal versus informal, um, traditional versus alternative assessment, all kinds of research has been done with that. Collaboration and interaction, other, another key area where there's a lot of research going on and um, more needs to be done, a lot specifically related to interactions between students and the content that they're interacting with, students and their peers, and students and the instructor, and how those various interactions uh, impact the teaching and learning environment. Um, success factors. This is kind of something that's had been beaten to death a little bit as well. Um, what factors impact student success in an online or hybrid learning? What, fa what student-centered factors impact that? and what teacher-centered factors impact that. So there's a lot. We know that more self-motivated students do better in online learning than less self-motivated. We know that when instructors are more responsive, that students tend to do better. So we know a lot about success factors in online and blended environments. Um, still more needs to be done, I think, with this, but uh, kind of there is quite a bit out there already on that. And then another one that's probably been done quite a bit is uh, student and faculty perceptions of online and blended learning. Um, we, we know a lot about how students feel about an online course or online strategies. We know a lot about how teachers feel about implementing an online course. Um, we, could, we could know more. Um, this is actually something I do a little bit of research in, so I can't talk too bad about it. But, we, we, we can do more on certain things, but there's been a lot of research done in this particular area. Okay, to the gaps. Um, so really five big gaps, and they're not in any particular order. There's not a countdown here. I would actually probably move this first one to higher up on the list as a, a bigger gap, and that is using data analytics to support course design and delivery. Uh, this could actually be, there's a, this could be done a lot in face-to-face -face settings too, um, in courses that implement learning management systems. Learning management systems provide a wealth of data. And nobody, well, very few people actually use that data to, um, m to impact the way they teach and deliver their courses. Or very few people actually teach people how to m mine that data to use it to uh, modify the way they teach. Um, to really personalize and provide adaptive learning environments for our uh, students. And are those good things? Well, we don't know how effective personalized learning is. It's a great trendy term to use, an adaptive learning great trendy term, but we don't know a great deal about how effective it is for teaching and learning. Um, this is just a screenshot, kind of can't really see some of the things here, of a tool that UCF uses called Realize It. Has anyone heard of Realize It? It's really hard to use. That's why I don't, I don't use it. But what it does is it provides individual learning paths. So this is an introduction to geography course. And this is a module on introduction to geography. The green big circle kind of indicates they did a pretty good job on it. Uh, the, so the color and the size of the circle is their level of performance. Then they give various paths. You can't see the paths here based on how they performed on this. And so here in Oceans of the World, they didn't do a great job. Um, but then their path is their their kind of suggested path is highlighted by this circle. So they kind of go through the, the learning environment based on their performance. Um, the problem with this is it's really, really time consuming to create. And again, if we're dealing with faculty members that have been teaching for 20 years and have their courses all kind of set up and, and what they feel is really good, it's hard to get them to kind of transition to personalizing and adaptive learning, particularly when there's not a great deal of research that says, it's the best thing since sliced bread, and everybody should be personalizing and adapt and making their courses uh, in adaptive learning modes. The second one is the effectiveness of methods for preparing traditional teachers, professors, and trainers to teach in online environments. There's um, kind of to exemplify this. This is a book that I published, co-edited a couple years back. And this is 100% not a plug of the book. It's actually probably the opposite. Um, anyone in here have insomnia? If you have insomnia, I highly recommend the book. If you don't have insomnia, don't get the book. Um, but the, what we envisioned with this book was 
there's a lot of stuff going on. We knew a lot of practice going on for preparing teachers to teach in online and blended environments. We knew, we knew our colleagues that were doing it. So we wanted to put together a volume of research related to preparing teachers to teach online. Well, there wasn't any. We sent emails to everybody and people we knew, people they knew, uh, people who they knew, they knew, uh, just extended networks and couldn't get anything. So what it turned into was a book on practice, what innovative practices on preparing teachers. No research base or anything like that, but it, tur it turned into something that we really didn't want. We wanted something that really highlighted the research related to preparing teachers and we, we didn't get that. We got a, a really great book on innovative practices, but not, not a whole lot of research. Um, the effectiveness of blended learnings and uh, blended learning in diverse settings. This is something that's just uh, really. I was excited to see a lot of the presentations here because there's a lot of talk about blended learning. What we really see with regards to blended learning is a lot of research in higher ed and not a lot of research in K-12 or non-traditional educational settings. So they're really uh, K-12 setting is something that will. Uh, that I see a real need for research related to blended learning here. And how, so how do, we, how do we merge online learning with in-class learning and with mobile learning to really maximize the, the learning environment? And even in higher ed, it doesn't really address some of these issues. The research out there um, currently doesn't address some of these issues. A lot of the research related to blended learning that I noticed tends to be the pedagogical kind of things that, that I talked about earlier. Um, the impact of new emerging technologies, um, so Web 2.0, Web 3.0, virtual and augmented reality and other tools on e-learning environments. So how many of you all recognize any of these logos? A couple of them. Does anyone know what this one is? A couple of you? Okay. How about this one? Erasma? Anyone done Pokemon Go? Was that a big thing in Italy? No. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big thing to me either. How about this one? Cardboard? Google Cardboard, that's pretty good. Um, how about this one, Sloodle? Anyone, does anyone know, has anyone familiar with Sloodle? I, I thought Sloodle was gonna be huge about 10 years ago. I was like, this is the, net, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then it just kind of disappeared. Um, uh, Google Wave is something that doesn't exist anymore, but I thought it was great. These tools, what the kind of the point here is these tools are constantly changing. Um, the functionality of these tools are constantly changing. So how do we prepare teachers, faculty members to be uh, flexible and um, adaptive in teaching with these tools? Because they're, they're not, the, the rate of change of these tools and the rate of change of functionality of these tools isn't gonna slow down. Um, we're, we're talking about Web 3.0, so how is the semantic web going to influence teaching and learning um, as far as personalizing learning, adapt, creating adaptive learning environments much more easily? So how do we prepare teachers to do Not a lot of research related to that. Again, a lot of practice, not a lot of research related to that. And then the last one is the efficacy of blended learning design models in varied settings and with diverse populations. And this is something that I got into an argument with a colleague of mine about is I thought we did a pretty good job with implementing blended learning. And he said that we really just give a lot of lip service to it. When we develop the models, they tend to be for, uh, there's no real research backing as to why we've selected that particular model. It tends to be a model of convenience. So when we're implementing it in a K-12 setting, we're implementing it based on convenience factors that are in play. And sometimes that's not something we can avoid, but sometimes it is, and there's no real research as to when we should implement various models uh, in different settings. So um, when should we use, in a rotation model, which is typical in K-12, when should we use a station rotation model versus a lab rotation model versus a flipped classroom versus an individual rotation model? You know, what do those even mean? Um, so what are, the, what are the factors that kind of influence, what are the decision factors on each of those? 
So those are my top five kind of issues, uh, gaps in e-learning research. And if anyone wants this, I'll send it to them later. I know it's all pictures, mostly pictures, but if anyone wants the, the tag, I, I'm happy to send it to y'all later. Um, but what are some things that we can do to kind of address those gaps? And um, just some real quick tips. The first one is follow the money. How am I doing on time? Am I okay on time? Okay. Um, follow the money. And uh, sometimes look, whether it's a, um, an educational priority or maybe a political uh, slant. Certain things get funded more than others. It's just a reality. And sometimes you have to kind of go outside your comfort zone to, uh, to kind of fund some of the research that you want to do. Um, so what, right now in the states, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics is getting funded like crazy. I had an engineering professor approach me wanting to do some innovative pedagogical approaches. Uh, we ended up submitting something like 14 NSF grants over the next two years because STEM was something that's just getting funded right now. Um, not exactly my wheelhouse, but we had a lot of commonalities. So we, we took advantage of those to create these, these um, uh, grant funding opportunities. Also, this is great for broadening the scope of your own research as well. Uh, I was a high school physics teacher before I got into the field I'm in now, uh, many, many moons ago. And if I had kind of stayed in that physics approach, I wouldn't have worked with 90% of the people that I've worked with over the years. All grade levels, all content areas. So really following, kind of going outside your, your comfort zone really broadens your, your research perspective. Um, take risks and tell stories. Uh, as with teaching, um, not everything works in research, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's important to try new things. It's important to learn from those things. It's important to share those failures with other people so they learn from your failures. So failures are something that are just as publishable as uh, successes. Um, be innovative uh, with your methods, with your topics and areas, and um, sometimes innovation uh, in other areas will actually apply to your area as well. Um, mind the data. I can't stress how important it is, how useful data mining is and teaching people how to mine data is. This is just a quick screenshot of one of my courses and the total activity. And just from looking at this, I could probably rank order how successful these students were in the course just on this and, and be relatively close. For example, the person who was in my course for 180 hours probably did a little bit better than the person who had spent an hour and a half in my course, right? So I can kind of tell just a lot just from this. This is one click away. I can immediately go and see what's going on with overall activity one click away. This is two clicks away. I can look and find out what students are doing um, day by day. So this is a screenshot of one of my students. And I see this student logged in and interacted almost every single day with my course, right? I can see they had these communications here, some with me, some with instructors. I can click on each of these things and get more information. And I can go deeper and do deeper dives. Um, I can look at the submissions. I can see oh, these submissions were all submitted on the due date. This one was submitted early. You know, I can see this, this person's kind of wait till the last minute sort of person. I can kind of look at, and I, there's a lot more data that I can go in and kind of look at as well. But if I compare that to this person, I can start seeing trends and issues and things that may influence the way I teach my courses. So there's a lot I can get from mining the data. Um, this is individual student data. How about if I look at a, an assessment? This is two test questions that I had. I'm almost done, so um, bear with me. Um, so here, these are two test questions, and I know 61% um, of these students answered this question correctly. Um, this one right here was uh, the, the biggest uh, distractor, I guess. Well, I know how I address this concept in the course. I do it through readings, and I do it through a, a, a web resource. Well, maybe I need to address it in a different way. Maybe not. Um, then uh, down here, this is a, this right here, I look at this. I see that only 34% answered, but really the big thing is unity and alignment. I think this is just a simple cons uh, a terminology issue. 
I don't use the term unity in my course anywhere. So it's not something that's explicitly addressed. No big deal, but I can, I can modify my instruction to create a more effective learning environment by looking at these for about 30 seconds and figuring out what the potential issue might be. And is it, do I need to simply change the, or do I need to change the way that I address that concept in the course? Or do I simply need to revise the test question? The, the, the two, two very valid uh, changes that can be done based on the, the data that's provided here. Um, and then this one's a little bit more ambitious. I just have two more tips. Start a journal. Um, this is a great community y'all have here, the, a ton of different organizations. Um, find some gaps in the literature or in the journals that exist and start one amongst your group, maybe pair up with a, with a, uh, a conference maybe. That's a great idea. Um, th these are just two quick examples. Multicultural Learning and Teaching was a group of professors at University of North Carolina at Charlotte that wanted to publish on multicultural learning and teaching and found that there weren't very many venues that allowed them to do that. So they started their own journal. They got a group of colleagues that were experts in the field together, put together an editorial review board. It was 100% web-based. They bought a web domain, created a nice site for it. People they submitted their articles to the editors via email. They had a group of reviewers that they would send out the reviewers reviews to for blind review, and they just published away. They just saw a, a, a gap in the existing uh, journals that were out there, created their own. Ultimately, I think after four years, it got per, uh, bought up, or not, I don't know if it's bought up. It got taken over by a publisher that made the system, they handled a lot of the system. They, they sort of developed the continuity of editorship and, and those kind of things. Um, kind of a, a, a ground, uh, ground up effort there, grassroots sort of effort, if you will. And then the International Journal of Gaming and Computer Medi Ugh, Mediated Simulations. Um, this, and the, this was somebody, again, saw a gap in the existing journals, wanted to publish in this area. There weren't a lot of venues that allowed them to do that. Approached a publisher with a proposal, and they 100% from the beginning started managing all of the, the legwork, so to say, with creating that journal. So a little more ambitious, but um, Definitely something that there that can be done. Um, the key thing with a journal is they say in, in real estate that uh, the three most important things are location, location, location. With a journal, the three most important things are quality, quality, quality. And if you put out low quality work and low quality publications, your journal is not going to be very successful, not not very well respected. So. That's a key issue is getting a really great team on board from the start that has the same vision regarding the quality of, that, of the publications. And then um, the last thing is uh, I was told that if I did an hour-long speech that I had to put pictures of my kids in it somewhere. And I don't have kids, so these are my cats. And this has absolutely nothing to do with the tip, but um, and that's talk to people. Um, I can't tell you over the years how many serendipitous conversations I've had with people that have resulted in extremely uh, career helping um, work. Uh, my two biggest, my two most cited works on Google Scholar are works from, with somebody that I did in business management at Elon University in North Carolina that I randomly talked to one day at a conference. I've published multiple books with, or book chapters with people that I've met randomly at restaurants and conferences. Um, uh, so they just talk to people and listen. And it's what I found also is even if they're saying something that doesn't relate to my work, I can kind of pull ideas from them and maybe even share ideas with them or with stuff that I've done. So just really talking to people really gets you kind of going um, in, in regards to. Uh, addressing these gaps. They're pretty cute, aren't they? Yeah, okay. All right, so um, that was all that I had for my presentation. I just wanted to kind of open it up to questions. Or do we have time for a few questions? Or And if you ask me an easy question that I can answer, I will give you a UCF pen with a highlighter on it. <laughs> but,
but if it's a hard question, you do not get a pen with a highlighter. And um, just before we go into questions, if y'all have, if y'all see me around the conference and, and want for, have questions that might be more appropriate for like a one-on-one -on -one or smaller group kind of thing, feel free to uh, ask me then. Um, here's my contact information and I have cards if anyone needs a card or wants a card or anything like that to kind of follow up with me afterwards um, as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Ok, eh, adesso eh, è il momento del dibattito, ci ha dato questo spazio, questa apertura a una, un dibattito, delle domande, una conversazione. Eh, la sessione è in inglese, quindi immagino che le domande debbano essere rivolte in inglese, ma insomma possiamo metterci d'accordo, ci, ci traduciamo a metà. Eh, io credo che, eh, che ci siano molti spunti interessanti, a partire dai numeri che sono stati esposti, cioè nell'Università nell di provenienza di Richard, che è una delle più grosse università pubbliche americane che fa ricerca di qualità e in termini di, di studenti, no? ha circa 70.000 studenti, 66.000 studenti abbiamo visto, e c'è una percentuale incredibile di studenti che frequentano corsi in modalità blended online, più del 40%, che è un numero che rispetto ai dati che noi abbiamo in Italia eh, mi sembra significativo e la direzione è quella di una, di una crescita costante degli, eh, degli utenti nei corsi online e blended in tutte le università statunitensi, cosa che sta avvenendo anche in Europa, ma con ritmi e con modalità un po' differenti. Un altro tema, secondo me, interessante, che quindi potrebbe essere una chiave, I'm, I'm just suggesting something in Italian, okay. and we will switch in English very soon, I mean you have time to, to, to drink a, a glass of water, whatever. <laughs> Eh, eh, no, diciamo, Un'altra suggestione secondo me importante è quella della rappresentazione dell'e-learning che mi pare di capire evidentemente negli Stati Uniti, almeno dalle parole di Richard, eh, stia rapidamente cambiando rispetto alle prime esperienze di dieci anni fa dell'e-learning, diceva lui sostanzialmente for profit eh, che è quello delle università telematiche che abbiamo visto anche in Italia, adesso l'e-learning a livello universitario nello spazio pubblico, nello spazio non profit sta aumentando, sta aumentando in termini di qualità, sta trasformando la rappresentazione. Forse anche, devo dire rispetto a questo, i MOOC hanno giocato un ruolo significativo perché hanno esposto dei contenuti di altissima qualità da università da tutte le parti del mondo con docenti che hanno messo proprio eh, la, la, la faccia, hanno messo la reputazione in gioco su corsi a distanza provenienti appunto da università estremamente qualificate sia all'estero che in Italia e questo ha costruito probabilmente delle condizioni diverse per ripensare la reputazione della, dei percorsi online e questo diciamo con qualche similitudine sta avvenendo sia in Europa che negli Stati Uniti. Un altro tema secondo me molto interessante che può aprire spiragli di ricerca anche insieme, anche collaborativi e su questo Richard l'ha detto più di una volta, cioè in, costruiamo piattaforme comuni, costruiamo dei ponti, costruiamo delle collaborazioni anche con gli Stati Uniti e quello della formazione dei professori universitari e la formazione dei docenti in generale sulle nuove tecnologie, sulle, sulle modalità di formazione a distanza. Io credo, molti di noi, vedevo prima, eh, ci sono una serie di colleghi che si occupano di questo in questa sala, noi abbiamo una serie di programmi, di progetti nelle università italiane sulla formazione dei docenti universitari eh, molti di questi progetti che a cui noi stanno conducendo hanno poi degli spazi significativi che riguardano anche la formazione delle nuove tecnologie. Eh, credo che sia quindi un tema su quale molti di noi si stanno testando, confrontando e eh, probabilmente non sarebbe male aprire appunto, eh, spazi di collaborazione anche con altri colleghi stranieri. Eh, devo dire che su questo, eh, guardo Pier Giuseppe Rossi, anche i colleghi spagnoli ci dicevano che era un tema che a loro interessava molto, quella della formazione continua dei professori universitari. Eh, Altre questioni particolarmente rilevanti sono quelle che riguardano poi i learning analytics. Evidentemente su questo, secondo me, soprattutto in Italia, c'è uno spazio enorme di lavoro, c'è un'area di 
di investimento che noi possiamo fare è importante come comunità, come comunità eh, interprofessionale, come conferenza, multiconferenza, come volete chiamarla, come contesto nel quale stiamo operando in questi giorni, perché è proprio un territorio nel quale eh, si incontrano diversi saperi, diversi, diversi modi eh, di fare ricerca e... Ehm, sia in termini di offerta di servizio sia in termini di progettazione del, dei corsi credo che ci sia molto da, da fare in termini di learning analytics ehm, e forse la comunità pedagogica e didattica in Italia eh, è un po' indietro rispetto a questa tematica eh, um, ultima questione probabilmente eh, che secondo me eh, appunto è di rilievo è, è quella delle tecnologie del futuro, quelle di, eh, le tecnologie che, che appunto stanno già entrando, come dicevo nella, nella presentazione in apertura, eh, le tecnologie della realtà virtuale, del, dell'intelligenza artificiale che ormai fanno già parte della quotidianità di molti di noi nella, eh, nella dimensione dell'intrattenimento, negli spazi informali e che sempre di più convergeranno nei, nella progettazione di percorsi learning. Su questo c'è da fare una riflessione interessante eh, anche perché, eh, come diceva Richard, bisogna seguire dove sono i soldi anche in questo momento, follow the money diceva Richard, ci sono grossi investimenti e ci sono anche spazi di ricerca su queste tematiche anche in virtù dei finanziamenti a livello europeo e nazionale che si stanno Uh, aprendo proprio su queste tematiche. Proprio in questi giorni penso molti di noi, almeno delle università del sud, che stiamo compilando i bandi PON per Industria 4.0, sappiamo bene quanto molte delle tematiche che sono state indicate adesso, cioè big data, learning analytics, realtà virtuale, intelligenza artificiale, robotica, sono al centro di grossi flussi di finanziamento e che quindi possono aggregare progetti di ricerca che vadano a esplorare in modo significativo questa tematica. Quindi eh, ringrazio ancora Richard e apro um, appunto, questo momento di confronto e di question time. So, please. Do we need a mic? Okay. about uh, blended learning programs. Um, I think that the most well, important chiedo benefit... Chiedo cortesemente se ci presentiamo ah. in apertura. Uh, ok, Mario lo faccio in italiano però. Se vuoi. Provo... <laughs> Mario <Provo> Calabrese. <laughs> I work in France in an engineering school. I am at the same time teacher and director of e-learning programs. Uh, I think that the most important benefit in blended learning program in the face-to-face -face time is not to promote the relationship between students and teacher, but between students themselves. And I read some research about the importance of, of peers in learning achievement. So what do you think? How can uh, this factor be promoted in blended learning programs. Thank you. Okay, do you mind if we collect some questions and you answer afterwards? We can, we can do that. That was an easy one, so I'm going to give him a Okay, so answer that. <laughs> well, I think that... Ha vinto una penna perché dice, appunto, le domande facili vince una penna, quindi... We have the first winner. I'm setting the bar really low here, so... Um, Thank you. Actually, so that's, there's actually a lot of research done in that, and really the biggest thing is uh, flipping the classroom. A lot of the flipped classroom models really follow that approach, and within the classroom setting. So a lot of, a lot of teachers will put their content online or their activities that 
accessing the content online where the students have to handle that before they get to class. Then they get to class and the activities involve peer collaboration in class. They involve um, working together on problem-based learning kind of things. Much more uh, active, engage, active learning environments than um, traditional kind of teacher-centered <coughs> items. So it's sort of flipping where the, the content acquisition is done outside and then all of the stuff that typically is done outside of the classroom is done in the class via a variety of collaborative settings. And depending on your, your individual course and what the dynamics of that course are and what the content of that course are, those are going to impact what that looks like. So if you have a course with 400 people, it's really difficult to do collaborative stuff inside the classroom. But if you have a class with 50 people, it's a lot easier to do that. Um, so the, a lot of, there are a lot of what ifs in, involved in that based on the dynamics of the course. But kind of flipping the classroom is one easy way to address that. OK. okay. Next one. Next one. Okay. They come. Remember, easy, easy equals pen. I have a question because I would like to have the pen. Okay. <laughs> that, that remains to be seen. But it's very, very easy. <laughs> What's the name? <laughs> uh, my question is this. I was wondering if you have... Anna Di Pace. Oh, sorry. Anna Di Pace, Università di Foggia. University of Foggia. And my question is, um, I was wondering if you, if you have some uh, MOOC platform, I don't know if you have, and if you have, if you are matching this kind of experiences of blended learning and the MOOC platform. So we actually recently put together a grant to create a MOOC and it's sort of a, um, the idea behind it is, is going to be in-house. Um, so we were going to manage it and, and run it through our learning management system and all that. But uh, the idea behind it was sort of a menu where you get to pick and choose what you do. But we haven't really, I don't have a specific platform like OpenEDU or anything like that that, that we've used for that. So um, it's kind of a, it, again, it's a, it, de it depends sort of thing. Um, OpenEDU does a lot of stuff. There's a, a Coursera does a lot of good yeah. things as well. So it really just depends on what your needs are. So you don't have your own MOOC platform? No, no, okay. no. I've actually never, I've participated in about four or five different MOOCs. Um, some really, really good, some really, really not so good. But uh, I've never actually created, like I said, we, we put together a grant to actually develop one. And kind of the idea is we've been in these MOOCs and these are the good elements from these MOOCs. Let's take those, and these are the bad elements. Let's avoid those and try and create something that's a, a positive, based on our experiences and the, and the research that's out there already. Thank you. So, I think that, that probably warrants a pen, maybe. <laughs> that was borderline, though. That was almost hard. So. Allora, Pier Giuseppe Rossi, Università di Macerata. Non voglio la penna. He doesn't want a pen. Oh, he doesn't want a pen? Okay. He's asking a tough uh, It's going to be a hard question. Great. Yeah. Chiedo anche, parlo in italiano, e chiedo magari se tu alcuni aspetti che possono essere interessanti li traduci. Anche perché penso, uh, vorrei rispondere più a, anche a quello che dicevi prima, perché mi sembrava importante. Eh, la prima questione è, eh, in una delle sue slide, si diceva che uno dei problemi per l'online è l'uso nell'online per l'internship, per i, le attività in contesto reale. Tant'è vero che per esempio scienza della formazione primaria non può essere online proprio per i lavoratori e per i tirocini. Secondo me questa è una questione che andrebbe approfondita e analizzata. Tu parlavi... Tu parlavi prima, Pierpaolo, dell'importanza del, delle nuove modalità operative, eh, nuove tecnologie, tecnologie virtuali o altro, e secondo me dovremmo pensare proprio con queste come rendere eh, il tirocinio e l'online compatibili. Chiaramente non che faccio online il tirocinio, ma io posso benissimo essere in azienda, essere nel lavoro e poi l'attività di riflessione fare online. 
mentre attualmente nella eh, ver, mh, situazione attuale neanche il tirocinio indiretto, quello che gli studenti fanno a scuola è possibile fare online. Penso invece che sarebbe molto, forse per certe cose sarebbe anche migliore l'online, perché l'utilizzo di strumenti eh, virtuali per la riflessione sulle attività in contesto. E quindi io credo che su okay. questo occorrerebbe riflettere anche col Ministero, proprio per capire quali potenzialità in più può dare eh, l'online rispetto alla presenza. E credo che proprio su queste questioni dove si dice che non funziona, è proprio là che potrebbe dare il valore aggiunto. Ad esempio potrei riflettere molto di più su qualcosa che avviene online quando, eh, vedendolo per esempio in, eh, su video o altro. Anzi, certe volte vedo di più su un video che stando in presenza. Pensate anche a situazioni eh, sala operatoria o, aulo, o altro. Non so cosa vede quello da lontano dalla finestrella o se vedrebbe di più attraverso un video o più video. Al di là del fatto che oggi c'è direttamente il chirurgo che opera col video, cioè con le nuove tecnologie. Per cui è strano che sia possibile operare con l'online e non studiare la stessa attività eh, in quel modo. Quindi ripensare alle nuove tecnologie può ripensare anche a rispondere a quella domanda che oggi è presente ed è pesante. L'altra questione invece è eh, rispetto a quello che dicevi tu. Oggi sulla formazione dei docenti universitari c'è molta eh, riflessione. Non è solo formazione, ma è come ripensare la didattica universitaria. Cioè, credo che oggi la didattica universitaria sia uno degli elementi in cui siamo ancora molto arretrati. Parliamo di nuovi modelli, ma in realtà la lezione frontale, anche perché quando c'è di fronte 150 studenti, eh, certe questioni sono o ripensi col blended, con altri strumenti, ma riflettere sulla didattica universitaria significa eh, formare, eh, ripensare insieme ai docenti come fare didattica. Io non penso che un docente possa andare a lezione e penso che quindi l'online possa in questo senso costruire momenti di riflessione per i docenti e formazione per i docenti in modo significativo potrebbe essere uno strumento interessante e su questo credo che potrebbero operare in sintonia varie università. Eh, so per esempio che già a Foggia eh, con l'online formano i nuovi docenti ed è obbligatorio per un docente assunto fare un corso di didattica della docenza. Eh, quello su cui mi piacerebbe anche vabbè, in un altro momento anche eh, sentire altre università la possibilità di costruire insieme dei materiali didattici e quindi costruire e proporre per la formazione universitaria qualcosa che vada al di là della singola università e operare in modo sinergico. Grazie. Well, I'll answer the second one or address the second one first. Um, I think that that's a great idea to collaborate with other universities because, like you said, if, if you're kind of late to the game as far as teacher training and, and faculty development, you need to know what, what else has been done, what works, what doesn't work, um, and also w what works in your setting versus other settings. I mean, we have thousands of faculty members, probably half of those teach some sort of online or blended approach. So just having a course that they have to go through and then they get certified to teach online, that's not enough. That's one thing. So we have a support, we have a whole department called the Center for Distributed Learning that supports faculty in developing their courses and implementing their courses, helps them create multimedia, helps them do all of these things that would go into their uh, online course. We have another uh, entire entity called the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning which talks to, uh, works with faculty on improving teaching methods, not specifically for online or blended, but that's one element of it. And then every, I don't know about you, but I don't go to centers, like I don't seek help a lot of times. I kind of want it to be near me. So a lot of the things that we found is, that's been useful is having localized expertise. So we have somebody down the hall that we can go to and say, hey, I'm ha I have this question. Right, so it's more of an on-demand kind of support with a peer or colleague as opposed to having to go set up an appointment to have a discussion with somebody else. So there's a variety of methods that can be useful. Um, 
for that. But I, I do agree that it's important to find out what's been done, find out what other people are doing related to that, and like develop maybe develop materials, co-develop materials, post them online that things that can be useful. There's a lot of things that can be done related to that. Um, does that answer the first question? Or second question? Yeah, I, um, I say yes. Yes, <laughs> okay. And then the first one. Scusa, faccio una brevissima, I will translate very briefly. No, la cosa centrale, c'è due parole che dice Richard, è che anche questo intervento evidentemente ha iniziato a rispondere alla seconda osservazione prima, lasciando l'altra questione di seguito, che bisogna, secondo lui è importante professionalizzare anche il servizio di supporto al docente e renderlo più prossimo, più vicino possibile alle esigenze del docente e anche proprio fisicamente. Loro si sono trovati molto bene a raccontare questa esperienza di aver creato dei, dei punti, dei centri di questo uh, Teaching Learning Center che sono distribuiti nelle diverse facoltà e nei diversi dipartimenti. Effettivamente, come accennavi, in molte università, noi a Foggia ci stiamo lavorando un po' di anni, ma molti altri lo stanno facendo, eh, sono mh, in atto dei processi per costituire delle strutture stabili che facciano assistenza, formazione continua al personale docente, chiaramente si tratta ancora di strutture embrionali con minimo personale presente, non è ancora pensabile di poter distribuire nei dipartimenti figure di questo genere, però credo che la direzione sia quella, ma sia proprio la direzione di un'università che si è trasformata, adesso sto aggiungendo ovviamente molto di mio rispetto alle cose che ha detto lui, quindi colpa mia, eh, un'università che si è trasformata in Europa anche in, in, con il processo di Bologna, mettendo al centro lo studente e trasformando qual è la nostra rappresentazione di insegnamento che appunto si sposta radicalmente, proprio una rivoluzione copernicana, non è più il docente al centro ma, il, ma è lo studente. Allora, se lo studente è al centro bisogna ragionare di competenze, di learning outcome, di risultati, di accountability e questo mette in discussione radicalmente il tipo di insegnamento che facciamo anche perché non è più l'insegnamento del singolo docente ma l'insegnamento del corso di studi e quindi c'è anche un processo di assicurazione della qualità che va tutto molto presente e le nuove tecnologie in questo senso sono una parte di questo discorso molto importante secondo me eh, bisognerebbe ragionare da dei progetti, potremmo sfruttare l'occasione per fare qualche progetto a livello internazionale. Sorry, I added myself to your so, please. And, and for the first one, I, again I agree that there are traditional course, there are things that are traditionally taught in face-to-face -face settings. Primary school, for example, a lot of, you know, having to deal with manipulatives. A lot of times those online settings are reserved for homeschooled students or students that might have issues that preclude them from attending um, public school settings. So uh, a lot of times with homeschooled stu students in the past, they would be schooled typically by their parents. Now a lot of times there's online support that helps them in the, in the homeschooling environment. Um, there are programs that prepare teachers and a set, uh, to teach online, so when they are doing their internships. There's actually the Florida Virtual School, they actually do online internships. So students that go through or have the option when they get to their internship to do it at the traditional uh, K-12 setting or they can do it at Florida Virtual School. Um, most definitely increasing technologies allow for much more to be done virtually than was done in the past, but there still are a lot of things that should probably are much more effective uh, when done online. When I, if I'm getting my appendix removed, I want a doctor that's actually physically removed an appendix, not one that's made a bunch of clicks on a screen and removed a, a, a virtual appendix. So th there's definitely certain things where the hands-on is much better. You always have quality and uh, trade-offs, um, but Overall, I think that most stuff can be done effectively online. It's just what kind of trade-offs you want, you want for that. May, may I add uh, something? Marina Rui, University of Genova. May I add something to what uh, Rossi and um, Pierpaolo said uh, a moment ago? Uh, because uh, in the traditional uh, teaching, we coordinate with other uh, colleagues, but at the end we are uh, ourselves just alone when we go in classroom and we do our work. In, uh, in this new kind of uh, job of uh, uh, learning, we, we need the staff, 
we need to work uh, with uh, instructional designer, this kind of thing. So you need, we need a team. And uh, as Pierpaolo said, we try to do a different university are trying to do so to create this uh, small group. But we have also, at least in my university, I think I'm not the only one, we uh, find out some difficulties because these competencies are not present and it's not so easy to find out in our university. So uh, it is uh, a job that uh, is uh, a work in progress in this moment. But uh, we have uh, real the, the need to consolidate uh, this uh, kind of structure in order to uh, have uh, a, a real um, quality, better quali to get a better quality in our job. I think it's a work in progress everywhere. Of course, it's, <laughs> it's a work in progress. And if it's not, then that's a problem. Because yes. if you're not trying to get better, but, then. But, but sometimes then also the bureaucracy in our it's uh, in our university so it's not easy to uh, find out the right competencies we need in order to create uh, this uh, this team yes. well and even if you can do them sometimes you know i'm I, one of the examples i gave was that the department chair said the university is moving away from online teaching mm -hmm. well that was back when i had if i changed the mode of instruction of a course i had to get approval to do that well, if he, he approved it, but he kind of threw his two cents in that, you know, I, I don't think it's the right thing to do, but I'll let you do it. Well, in some institutions, maybe that person wouldn't have approved it. I mentioned engineering education. The faculty member tried to teach a blended course, and it was impossible. It took him like three, three semesters to get it approved. So there's a lot of issues related to bureaucracy everywhere. This is something else that should be addressed. Uh, questo è anche molto importante, è una questione di più di politica interna universitaria, cioè come si valuta poi il carico didattico di chi fa formazione a distanza, questo è un problematico, è una tua domanda, te la sto anticipando, perfetto. Did you say no, no political comments, is that what you said? No, I was saying oh. that it is a, a oh, political politics. issue in terms of uh, poli uh, academic politics. Def yeah. Oh, definitely. And it's actually the question she's asking. Hello, Richard. Hi. Hi. My name is uh, Elena Caldirola from the University of Pavia. And I play the role in this university to be the head of an office whose name is Innovation in Didactics and Digital Communication Unit. So this is just the topic for me, the topic, <laughs> the right topic, okay. Differently from <clears throat> uh, Marina Rui, University of Genova, in my university we created a specific staff with skills and different comp competencies in order to help and support uh, faculties, professors, and specialists in building up uh, resources from online learning, blended learning, and so on. We have a recording studio. So for example, we can uh, record lessons and we can post-produce it. We have a specific learning lab. Uh, we have learning spaces with a lot of multimediality and so on. So the problem for us, University of Pavia, is not how, is not staff, is not person, is not competencies, and is not money. <laughs> the problem for us is what Pierpaolo was talking about, that is the workload of the professors. Since in, in Italy, we have strictly regulamentation that the professor had a certain number of hours, and these hours are contact hours with the student. So if professors decide to um, deliver a course with more and more abilities, online facilities, and video, and blended learning, and assignment, and more resources, and more interaction, beautiful thing, but it is uh, at the expenses of the professor. Okay? It is uh, simply more workload for the professor. So this is the reason why, for me, it is quite difficult to convince professor is not for a personal motivation to do more. Okay? This is the real problem for us in Italy context. Okay? So for example, in my university, we have perfect learning management system, system where professor can upload a lot of material resource, some assignment, some fora, 
some exercise, and that's fine. But it is very difficult to um, break this wall that is to go forward and uh, to uh, build new form of innovation in didactics because the workload is completely on the shoulders of the professor. For me, in Italy, this is really the point. Okay? And, and that's definitely an issue that's kind of related to the engineering colleague of mine that wanted to teach blended and yeah. the department chair said, well, great, now you can teach another course because you're only meeting half time. Excellent. So it's a similar kind of issue. Um, and it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what blended and online learning is. There's research out there, like I said about the unlimited enrollments, there's research that says that the workload at a graduate level of a face-to-face -face class of 25 students, the equivalent workload for an online course would be 17 students. So it takes, what's that, 12, 15% more time and effort to teach a a uh, an online course than a face-to-face -face course. Because in a face-to-face -face course, I can, answer I can answer questions all day. Well, in an online course, I'm getting a question here, a question here, a question here. I'm answering them all multiple times. Um, so that's, that's a problem. The, big, the only thing I can recommend is politics. We have a faculty senate at the university, at most universities at, uh, in the states have a faculty senate that push policy change. Um, getting uh, this, this environment here, this group, to push towards uh, removing policies that are archaic. Um, you know, I understand the contact time thing, but can you do contact time via uh, virtually? Like, you know, I do, I do webinars and synchronous webinars, and it's the same thing as teaching face-to-face, -face, only there's screens there instead of me physically in front of them. So are those types, so maybe baby steps to try and getting that, that kind of policy removed. I don't know what the likelihood is because I'm not familiar with the political climate and, and how, how hard it is to get policy shifted. Um, but that would be the only, the, I guess the, the, the only recommendation I could really make right now is you know, kind of start pushing towards policy shifts. And, and you get, I would be armed with research and, and data when you're going in to talk to people. Because these are people that are making decisions that don't know what, I don't want to say they don't know what they're talking about, but they don't have that expertise in that area. So, I mean, we're all familiar with many instances where people who make decisions who shouldn't be making decisions because they're not in your world. So I, I think it's important to kind of be able to back up what, what you're saying when you go talk, when you talk to them and, and try and get that policy shift kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's a fight. It's a it's a continual effort. You have to kind of keep going, going, going. Um, it, you know, if you take a break, then sometimes you're, you know. Just to conclude uh, with a, um, a brief sentence, uh, the um, bottom-up movement is okay. People are willing to, uh, faculties are willing to, professors are willing to, teachers are okay, and students are happy about these, these new methodologies. The problem for us is the top down, is the top down, because we need regulation, we need approbation, we need encouragement by, by uh, the policy, not only from, by the single university but a general movement in Italy from the ministry. This is, in my opinion and in my experience, lacking in this moment. I think I read somewhere that the average age of a university faculty member in Italy is 63. And that probably means they've been teaching. Is that too high? It was, it was Wikipedia, so it must be right, right? In, in, in public university, we, we have a rule that is a national rule, oh, okay. and then, as uh, um, Elena said, uh, in many universities in Genova too, we started to give our rule for people that work in e-learning in order to recognize uh, what they do. But the problem is that uh, any university is starting to do 
by itself, uh, uh, just waiting for uh, the, some movement from the central government, the uh, general framework in which uh, to, uh, to really find our position. Yeah, it takes time. Yeah, it's definitely time consuming and getting, on, getting the people at the top on board, so the ones that are top buy-in, that's, that's your biggest thing, so. Okay. Sorry, I could be more help. That was a, that was a moderately hard question, so. I don't know. No, I'll get it. Yeah, okay, great. great. Another pen. So, any other question? Time for other any, questions. We still have a couple of pens here. Any other question? Domande? Ci sono ancora un paio di penne qui che aspettano di essere attribuite. Il professor Rossi ha fatto domanda difficile, quindi niente penna. Okay. Eh, Fontana Luciana, azienda Alberto, sanitaria di Trento. Eh, io volevo uscire dall'ambito accademico e portarvi invece nell'ambito aziendale in, in, in mio caso nella, della, un ambiente sanitario. Noi abbiamo un sacco, tantissime richieste, tantissimi obblighi di legge eh, per formare i professionisti, sicurezza, eh, sicurezza, mh, nella, cioè, nel, che ne so, sicurezza dei, datori, dei lavoratori, sicurezza dei pazienti, eh, formazione, obblighi di legge che devono coinvolgere tutti i dipendenti di un'azienda sanitaria. La formazione a distanza per noi è il top perché chiaramente ci consente di ridurre al minimo eh, la, come dire, la, lo spostamento del dipendente dall'unità operativa all'aula per cui la formazione a distanza è il massimo per noi per tutto quello che può essere trasferito online. Ci sono delle situazioni in cui eh, la legge ci impedisce di farlo. Eh, ci sono dei corsi per i quali la legge dice che non possono essere fatti online dove per noi sarebbe fondamentale poter adottare perlomeno il sistema blended, cioè tutto quello che può essere messo online si mette online, tutto quello che inevitabilmente, perché prevede l'acquisizione di competenze e abilità pratiche, va portato in aula nel minimo tempo indispensabile. Volevo sapere com'è la situazione negli Stati Uniti. Yeah, actually, we have a lot of our work, um, it, as far as like in the medical field, is done online. A lot of the training and the continuous education stuff is done online. Um, if you give me your contact information, I can share some models and some work that's been done. Um, we have a pretty, we have this area in Orlando called Medical City, and it has representation from the Veterans Affairs Hospital, University of Central Florida, University of Florida, which is uh, the biggest, un the highest rated university in, in Florida um, and a couple other entities and they do a lot of work in virtual um, training and continuing ed with nursing uh, a ton and I could share some of the, some of the work that and put you in touch with some people but we do a lot of stuff with that um, in the in the United States in general not just in Florida so again it's policies and being able to get past those um, kind of barriers to, that say you must do this online or face to face and it's the only way you can do it um, you know those are things that you just have to push through and and you know fight for change to, to get it to where you know that you could do most of the stuff online right it would be fine it's just getting that implemented non ci sono altre domande ha vinto la penna bene complimenti ultima penna assegnata this was the last one, so if there are no other questions, um, I'll do some logistic remarks. And, uh, okay, and thank you, thank you for... Thank you. So, ringraziamo Richard e io faccio... Richard ha detto di essere disponibile per chiacchierate individuali anche durante le giornate della conferenza perché resta con noi fino alla fine. E io però approfitto di questo tempo per due eh, annunci. Uno tecnico, il più importante, è che alle 18.30 c'è l'aperitivo qui. Quindi, giusto? 18.30? 18.30? 18 c'è l'aperitivo, quindi informazione... 18.30, 6.30 c'è l'aperitivo qui, 
La, uh, la seconda informazione invece che intendo comunicarvi riguarda due corsi che stiamo organizzando all'Università di Foggia, si tratta di due laboratori gratuiti, quindi per chi fosse interessato ci sono due colleghi di Richard dell'Università appunto della Florida Centrale, l'Università di Orlando, che verranno a Foggia nell'ultima settimana di settembre, nella prima settimana di ottobre, sono due corsi, uno è un corso sul game design, loro hanno, verrà Tom Carbone from uh, uh, UCF will, will come to Florida, that is uh, the director of uh, this uh, design, game design school, that is Tom Carbone, Carboni, well I will give you the information, uh, and Barry Mauer, you, you know Barry Mauer? Ok, è un collega di ma non lo sa. No, lo sa. Tom Carbone, che è il direttore di questa scuola che è molto importante eh, negli Stati Uniti, che produce, eh, che, che forma eh, post laurea studenti eh, progettisti di videogame, quindi verrà per una settimana a fare un corso sul game design. Tenete presente che questa scuola nel centro di Orlando è un capolavoro di tecnologia finanziata da Electronic Arts, da Disney, quindi in, in, le maggiori industrie che si occupano di videogame eh, formano eh, i loro esperti in scuole come queste e noi faremo per una settimana quindi un seminario gratuito per 15 persone, quindi bisogna prenotarsi, sul game design. Il secondo seminario invece è un, un collega Uh, di Richard che dirige un altro dottorato sempre alla UCF che è su Text and Technology e il, uh, che si chiama Barry Mauer, il corso sarà un corso invece di metodologia della ricerca testuale, uh, metodologia della ricerca della media education ma l'enfasi è sull'analisi dei testi, quindi è un, uh, un corso che mischia um, digital humanities e media education di metodologia della ricerca, quindi se volete un corso adatto a dei dottorandi di ricerca o dei dottori di ricerca che vogliano eh, specializzarsi su tecniche di analisi testuale, testuale inteso non necessariamente come sarà l'ultima eh, settimana di settembre e la prima settimana, adesso per i pedagogisti eh, io invierò alla SIPED la mail che poi riceveremo tutti quanti, quindi eh, lo dicevo anche per la comunità più allargata che magari non, non legge le informazioni nei canali eh, nostri. Ecco. Eh, sono, ripeto, seminari gratuiti, l'unico vincolo è di prenotarsi prima perché ci sono soltanto 15 posti, le lezioni saranno fatte soltanto in inglese, quindi un requisito fondamentale è la conoscenza della lingua inglese. Grazie.